I'm Agnieszka Niemark, and this is the Boyce Thompson Institute Centennial Oral History Project. It's the June 12, 2023. My interviewee today is Daniel Klesik. Daniel is a scientist in plant molecular biology and the former BTI president between 2000 and 2024. Dan retired in 2021, but remains affiliated with the Institute as an emeritus professor. We are recording this interview in the president's office at the Boyce Thompson Institute, courtesy to the current president, David Stern. Daniel, thank you so much for taking part in this project. It is my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, before we discuss your affiliation with BTI, your work here as a scientist and uh, as executive manager, I would like to start with you telling us a little bit about your background and about your undergraduate studies. I grew up in a dairy farm uh, in northeastern Wisconsin near Green Bay. Uh, dairy farms are one of the worst places to grow up in terms of nothing but work. 18-hour uh, days were pretty normal. I had uh, five brothers or four brothers. There were five boys. Uh, we didn't have much time for play. I think we had a three-day vacation once with my parents. We slept in the Rambler, and we got as far as Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. That was the extent of any vacations in my 18 hours uh, in Wisconsin. I was very happy to get off the farm, and so I decided to become a biochemist. I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison in biochemistry. There I took a wonderful course by Robert DeMars, a genetics course, and discovered uh, my love in life, and that was molecular biology. He was describing the 1960 Jacobin Minobes model of the operon for gene expression in prokaryotes. I immediately knew that for the rest of my life I was going to be trying to understand how genes were regulated. Immediately after the lecture, I went to him and asked, who could I work with to get more experience? And he, accept, accept, he suggested Howard Temin. Well, Howard Temin was uh, very well known. He eventually got the Nobel Prize together with uh, David Baltimore for the discovery of enzymes that convert RNA into DNA. Enzymes had already been known that convert DNA into RNA, but this discovery was an amazing discovery, and he eventually received a Nobel Prize with David Baltimore. He rejected me, uh, sort of poo-pooed, I was an undergraduate, but he suggested that I go to uh, maybe work in James Dahlberg's lab, who was a beginning assistant professor and had just returned uh, from Cambridge where he had done a postdoc with Fred Sanger. Fred Sanger had just received a Nobel Prize for his work in developing uh, mechanisms or methods to sequence proteins. Uh, Fred Sanger eventually would go on to get a second Nobel Prize for determining or developing methods to desequence DNA. Jim uh, was uh, very gracious, and he held my hand uh, through a year and almost two years of undergraduate research. I did very well scholastically, uh, and at the end of my actually the end of my junior year, beginning of my senior year, I got an invitation to apply for the Rhodes Scholar, the Fulbright Scholar, and the Marshall Scholarship. Well, this was quite a honor just to be invited, but I thought the chances were almost none. Nonetheless, I went for an interview uh, in Chicago and received one of the 24 uh, Marshall Scholarships uh, to trained basically uh, at one of the universities, the top universities in the universe or in uh, the UK for two years. Um, that was a, a really, really interesting time. But let me interject one thing. Um, during the summer before I left, 
Jim convinced me that it would actually be better to go to the University of Cambridge uh, because it's where he had done his training and so it's where there were many Nobel laureates and great programs in molecular biology. Unfortunately, when I sent the letter to the Marshall Scholars, in London, there was a six-week postal strike, and the letter never went through. Uh, fortunately, it was good because I ended up at the University of Edinburgh, and they had just moved two years before the molecular genetics program from Cambridge to Edinburgh and started one of the first, if not the first, departments of molecular biology. And that's where I did my training for, for two years. Yeah. You mentioned to me, Dan, that uh, the University of Wisconsin was a quite tough institution to go through as undergraduate scholar. And you also mentioned that that year when you got a Marshall Scholarship, among the 24 scholars, I think three came from Wisconsin. Can you tell us a little bit about the that, level of studies? At that, that was, well, first of all, let me address the question of uh, how difficult was it, it be a student at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, they had, uh, the legislature determined that uh, the it was University of Wisconsin-Madison was too elite. They wanted to have more people coming from the high schools that weren't in their top 5%, but maybe in the top 10 or 15%. So the University of Wisconsin had to accept these people, but they did not want to drop the the uh, standards, and so they basically flunked out three-fourths of the students. I was told the first day I arrived during um, orientation that I should look around the rest of the uh, beginning freshmen and that within four years only one of the four of us would graduate, and indeed that was the case. Extremely. Uh, difficult. Yeah. And going back to your uh, studies at the University of Edinburgh, tell us a little bit more what kind of uh, studies you did there, in which department, and what happened after that. So I uh, entered the Department of uh, Molecular Biology because that's what I really wanted to do. Uh, that was an excellent department, and I studied. Uh, prokaryotic molecular genetics, took courses and did a little bit of research uh, and then graduated after two years with the equivalent of a master's degree. What happened next? Well, I had applied to um, Harvard uh, as a backup because I thought the chance of getting a Marshall Scholarship was almost non-existent. In fact, it was competing with it's what was called the creme de creme uh, of the best students and the best universities throughout the United States, and there were only 24 positions. So the po possibility that I would get one, it was, I, I mean, I was shocked when I actually got it. So I had applied to Harvard, and so I reapplied, and Harvard uh, immediately accepted me, in fact, that it held a position for me. Um, at Harvard, uh, I wanted to study eukaryotic molecular biology because I had had a very good experience with prokaryotic molecular biology, very good training at uh, Edinburgh. Jim Watson somehow found out that that was my interest and he invited me uh, to do a rotation, a research thesis rotation for a few months to come down to Cold Spring Harbor where he was director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in addition to his full professorship at Harvard in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. So I indeed did. Uh, we had a very successful uh, few months and I then accepted his uh, gracious invitation to become his graduate student. Can you tell us a little bit more about your research uh, during your PhD program at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab and a little bit about this institution as well? Certainly. So uh, I studied, my project was trying to understand why human adenovirus could not replicate or grow in monkey cells. So this is of interest because pharmaceutical companies were trying to make vaccines against the human adenovirus because it causes a severe respiratory illness, like a severe cold, and that was particularly a problem with military 
recruits? Well, they don't want to make it the virus in human cells because the human cells might have other human viruses, so they decided, well, monkey cells are pretty close. Uh, they failed, um, and my research thesis was to figure out what happened? Why couldn't adenovirus, human adenovirus, grow in monkey cells? And I discovered that there was a disruption in the expression of some of the genes of the adenovirus genome. Now, about that time, Rich Roberts and was working with Rich Gelinas. Rich Roberts had come from Harvard, started a research program at Cold Spring Harbor, and he brought with him Rich Gelinas as a postdoc. And they were also studying human adenovirus, but now asking something about gene expression of human adenovirus in human cells. And much to their surprise, they found that at the end of the messenger RNAs for the different genes of adenovirus, they all had the same series of nucleotides, about 20 nucleotides, which just didn't make any sense. And in parallel, my studies on a couple of genes in the monkey cells, but also in the human cells, found the same thing. Well, this was very, very confusing. And the reason it was so confusing is that the central dogma of molecular biology is you start with DNA, that DNA is transcribed or copied at a given start point in the DNA to make a messenger RNA. And that start point is called a promoter. And so each gene should have its own promoter, and so there should be at the five prime end of each of these messenger RNAs different sequences. Well, I had found in the two genes I was studying, 100K and fiber, it had the exact same sequence. And this was the same sequence that Rich Roberts and Rich Gelinas had found when they did a bulk analysis of these messenger RNAs. So this is a very confusing. Uh, most of the people, including Jim Watson, when we described our work, uh, thought we were just studying a fluke, an artifact. Um, in fact, there were very few people that believed we were onto something. One of them, most importantly, was Barbara McClintock, who told me, Dan, stay with it, follow your instinct. And that's just what I, I did. Uh, we were eventually proven correct by the beautiful electron micrograph R loops. Uh, these are pictures of RNA that's being hybridized to DNA, and there were loops in the DNA. They called it R. These pictures were taken by Louise Cha working with Rich Roberts and um, Susan Brigette working with Phil Sharp. So this was in convert, uh, evidence that couldn't be denied that what we were seeing was real. It wasn't an artifact. And so I proposed the RNA splicing model in which I said, in the case of the adenovirus, and probably more generally, the RNA polymerase would get at the promoter. It would make a RNA. But that RNA needed to have another step before it became a messenger RNA. It needed to have spliced out certain pieces of that RNA to make a functional messenger RNA that then could be decoded by ribosomes into proteins. So this was a central change in the dogma theory of gene expression in genes in eukaryotes. It was different in prokaryotes. So then, Eventually, that led to the Nobel Prize by Rich, to Rich Roberts and Phil Sharp for the, that discovery of RNA splicing. Yeah, so that was a great achievement during your PhD program, right? In a foundational research that led uh, later to uh, very important discoveries. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit more and tell us about also Barbara McClintock, who she was and your relation with her during your time at Cold Spring Harbor? So right. Barbara was this amazing person. She was retired at that point. She had a small uh, lab 
where she kept her uh, corn, uh, different corn uh, seeds from all of her work on corn. She discovered <clears throat> what was eventually referred to as jumping genes uh, or transposable elements. Our DNA in, in our, ourselves and in most uh, species in fact, is filled with these jumping genes or these uh, transposable elements. In fact, in humans, they say that about, we used to say about 96% of the genome was junk because it didn't code for a messenger RNA that was then decoded into a protein. And that junk was actually transposable elements, and as we learn more and more, those were incredibly important as we evolved. Uh, this, she was, didn't receive the Nobel Prize till I think uh, 1983. Those discoveries, many of which were done uh, just down the street here at, at Cornell, where she had done her undergraduate as well as her PhD. She was in a, just amazing. And in fact, if she had lived, uh, she could have received two more Nobel Prizes for telomeres, which is the ends of chromosomes, as well as epigenetics, because she talked about change of state uh, when in the uh, maze system. So then, during your time at uh, Harvard and Cold Spring Harbor Lab, uh, you, not, you not only helped to solve this uh, puzzle related to uh, uh, RNA splicing, but you work with a lot of interesting people. But we still don't know how you started to work on plants, because your work eventually will be in the molecular, plant molecular biology. Explain to us transition that happened after your PhD, and also how you started to work at uh, the Waxman Institute. You would think that I should have been extremely happy with the discovery, and I certainly uh, was of RNA splice, split genes and RNA splicing. But I realized that uh, the time was right, that it was going to be discovered by someone else uh, if I hadn't done my small uh, part within probably six months or so. And with all that work, 18 hours a day, uh, lots of stress, I said, well, I'd like to do something where I would make a difference if I didn't uh, discover something. Maybe it would never be discovered, or maybe it would be years. And I realized that there was very little work in the area of molecular biology in plants. In fact, Jim Watson tried to convince me not to think about plants because he said it, no, no one had ever made any progress in understanding uh, plants. Um, Barbara McClintock, of course, was very influential and said, you should follow what you, what your instincts. If you think that's where you can make a difference, and NSF was very keen for having people like myself, coming from the uh, medical field with training in molecular biology, to move uh, into uh, plants. And so I began a program with the support of NSF uh, in plants in 1982 at uh, the medical school uh, at the University of Utah. First on Rubisco, which is the most abundant protein on Earth. Uh, it is responsible for converting CO2 into sugar and oxygen, on which most life in, on the Earth d depends. And we also started uh, with the um, assistance or financial help of the USDA to begin to study plant pathology. Uh, and that's how eventually I got into salicylic acid, which I'll talk about more later. Yeah, sure. And could you tell us how the story with the Waxman Institute at Rutgers University uh, begins? So I went to Utah in, two th um, in 1980. Um, in 1984, Yo Messing called. And now Yo, I <clears throat> knew very well from his pioneering work uh, in genetic engineering where he had developed the uh, M13 cloning vector, which was a critical uh, vector for manipulation of DNA and, and was absolutely crucial for sequencing of DNA, particularly the human genome, plant genomes, et cetera. 
uh, he had started, <clears throat> excuse me, he had started a program uh, in plants and was interested at, uh, he was then at the uh, University of uh, Minnesota. He had started a program in doing corn research, but he was being recruited by Rutgers, who uh, there was a major push in New Jersey to make Rutgers a first-rate university. It was really a, a third-rate university. It was a teaching university, very little modern research, and they felt that it was really critical that New Jersey, which had more PhDs uh, per capita than any other state because of AT&T, Bell Labs, and the massive pharmaceutical industry, they wanted a first rate. And so lots of money had been um, uh, proposed or, or, or uh, made into law, a big grant, uh, bond issue of $100 million to improve the Waxman Institute as well as to start new um, centers in the area of molecular biology, modern biology. And Yo was being recruited, and he asked whether I would consider joining him as um, the associate director of the Waxman Institute. Uh, and I, that's what I did. And for the next 15 years, we spent uh, enormous amounts of time uh, reinvigorating the Waxman Institute with many hires, uh, starting the two new centers, the Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Medicine, the Biotech Center for uh, Agriculture and the Environment, hiring the founding uh, directors as well as uh, participating in hiring the first junior faculty. We also um, ended up in hiring new uh, department chairs, Department of Biological Sciences, the chemi biochemistry department, and the medical school. The end result was that it was a massive transformation. It was rapid and dramatic. Uh, it took a lot of energy. Uh, there was a lot of controversy. Uh, but in the end, uh, it was very successful. We, at the Waxman Institute, uh, three new members of the Institute became members of the National Academy. Uh, Yo Messing won the Wolf Prize, uh, which is the equivalent of a Nobel Prize in agriculture. Uh, we hired, uh, of the hires uh, in the various departments in the institutes, there were five new Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, investigators, uh, two at the Waxman, two at the Center for Advanced Biotechnology, and one in the biochemistry department. Uh, furthermore, uh, Rutgers was invited to become a member of the elite group of top 50 research universities, that is the Association of American Universities. Um, so it was very successful. So you were credited in uh, various articles about your career for doing a great uh, job with uh, revit revitalizing the Waxman Institute and uh, putting, you know, uh, Rutgers University on the map when it comes to this field of research. Could you just then explain a little bit better why your Messing contacted you, why he wanted uh, you to join him on this uh, quite difficult uh, mission? And could you also talk a little bit more in details about the challenges that you really <laughs> face when you arrive with Messings to Rutgers, like both at the scientific level and management level, because I think you had to deal with both, uh, right? <laughs> so to address the first question, uh, I was very successful uh, at the University of Utah, having grants from NIH, USDA, NSF, um, multiple special scholarships. So I think I had six grants. And so I had the, a, a, a clear history of success at getting grants. I was well known now for my work in RNA splicing and adenovirus so on the animal side. And I was starting plants, and he was interested in plants. Uh, so uh, that gave uh, we we were com we were complementary. You know, I was not 
uh, at the top of my field. In fact, I had done very little in engi uh, uh, genetic engineering, but he was he was Mr. Genetic Engineer. Um, the the challenges were immense. There was an enormous amount of uh, pushback. Uh, there was this massive amounts of money that was being put into these new programs, and so the existing faculty, uh, rightfully so, were were very jealous. Uh, there was also uh, um, poor facilities. Um, uh, poor administration, trying to get things, just simple ordering of, of uh, supplies. Uh, I almost quit at one point. In fact, I, I threatened to, to leave because I was spending so much time just trying to get the physical centrifuges working, washing machines working so that we could, could do uh, research. Uh, so it was a, a very, very challenging. Right. Yeah. Good. So you work with Jo Messing for about 15 years, right, right. between 1985 and 2000. And it seems that both of you <laughs> were looking for some fresh air after that time, as we right. discover later. Right. Uh, could you tell us if you were familiar um, at that time of your work at the Waxman uh, Institute uh, about what was happening uh, here at the Boyce Thompson Institute and about the uh, you know, scientific research here? Right. So <clears throat> I had some familiarity because in the 1980s, I was asked to review at Cornell some of their um, biology program. And their biology program overall was frankly quite weak, in particular in comparison to chemistry and physics where there are a number of Nobel laureates. Um, I think part of our report, our report had, had some influence in finally uh, Cornell building a biotechnology building, constructing it and hiring a number of faculty who, by the way, went many of several of which went on to become members of the National Academy. Um, Charlie Arnst, or sorry, when Ralph Harding was president, he asked Charlie Arnston to do a review of BTI, and Charlie asked, um, Joan, uh, Joanne Curry and myself to help him with that review. So I was fairly familiar uh, with uh, what was going on at, at Cornell and, and, and the BTI. And in fact, I was quite attracted because um, Cornell, uh, despite uh, not very, very good in overall new biology, um, the, the um, plant part of Cornell was one of, still one of the best in the, in the world. So there are a lot of good plant people here, plant researchers. Plus, uh, Ralph Hardy had uh, started a plant molecular biology program. He brought in Steve Howell, who then went on to uh, recruit David Stern and Robert Lass as junior faculty. Uh, when Charlie arrived, uh, he ended up uh, hiring Greg Martin and Tom Brutnell. And so there was a really strong nucleus of, of people here as well as down the street at, at Cornell. And I was going more and more into plants. So I said, this is a much better place to do plant research than, than uh, Rutgers, even though Rutgers was now coming along. Uh, so I asked Charlie, you know, could I come as a, uh, as a senior scientist? And he was quite excited about it, but realized that didn't, there weren't any openings. Um, but I guess within a year or two, like maybe two years, he uh, approached me again and said, Dan, I'm going to step down at the end of my five-year term. Would you consider applying for the presidency? And so uh, having had administrative uh, experience, it made sense, but also realizing that, my God, uh, doing administration, particularly if you're trying to upgrade places, is just an enormous task. Um, Greg Martin uh, also asked me to consider it. We met at a meeting, or he approached me at a meeting in, in Europe, um, and so I threw my hat in the ring, and that's how I got, became the president. 
Right. So you were selected to become the president of BTI in uh, 2000. Mm -hmm. Then could you talk first about the new challenges that you encounter at, at uh, BTI now uh, to start with? And uh, if you could talk about the challenges also at both levels on the scientific side, the research side and administrative uh, and management side of the institute. Yeah, um, having seen some of it from the distance, I knew that there, while there were real strikes, particularly with the new uh, hires in, in the plant area, uh, there were uh, lots of weaknesses and that if uh, the Boyce Thompson was to become a truly first class institute in modern biology that significant changes were required. Um, in order to change places, uh, one of the most important things is you need new positions to be able to hire uh, new faculty. Fortunately, Charlie had already started the process. Uh, he had made arrangements with, I believe, six of the more senior faculty for their retirement at uh, 65, so there were positions that were going to be open. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that cost a lot of money uh, to the endowment and to uh, the pension. Um, the next thing is you need money. You can't just bring in faculty without money to set those faculty up and giving them a, a start with a good research laboratory and some money. Um, and there was only $300,000 in the kitty, basically, which was uh, essentially nothing. I mean, you can't do much with 300000 So my first um, job was to find more money. Uh, well, how do you find more money? One is you cut staff. So I did a 20% across the board cut of staff, uh, not including faculty, which made me the most unpopular person at the Institute for the first year. Uh, the second is to try to bring in money. Um, and so I was very successful with the help of uh, Jerry Mindwall and Tom Eisner, the two fathers of chemical ecology at Cornell, uh, to get a grant from the uh, Atlantic Philanthropies for $5 million to start the program in molecular and chemical ecology. That enabled us to BTI and Cornell to hire five new faculty, which much of their salary paid for for the first several years and much of their sa setup packages paid for, which was a, uh, a godsend for us because it allowed us to hire Maria, Hansen, Amir, Maria Harrison, um, George Dander, and eventually Frank Schroeder. Um, and the other was uh, to shepherd a, the transition of uh, funding from the uh, Park Foundation uh, to the Triad Foundation, which is again had more difficulties, uh, personality difficulties between uh, in the Park family. Um, and we did that with the beginning of a program in plants and human health. So we switched from biodiversity that Charlie had uh, started to plants and human health. So uh, that solved somewhat the money problem. Um, then there was the problem of culture. Um, but the culture was one of uh, entitlement, in my opinion, and it needed to become one of self-reliance. That is, if you wanted to do have a productive graduate, a productive research program, you needed to support that program through direct through money coming from the outside, from outside funding, usually from federal granting agencies like NSF, NIH, US uh, DA. That was already happening in some programs, but not others, particularly. Uh, very well done in, in the plant biology program with the new hires. Um, 
The other was to try to um, change the culture of self-sufficiency and put competitiveness into the system. So I instituted pay for performance. That was based on an annual review. The better you did, the more research you did, the more grants you brought in would likely increase your, your salary. The other was to change uh, appointments from a 12-month appointment to a nine-month appointment where uh, the faculty were expected to pay for two or three months of their salary from outside funding. Um, and the third, and importantly, was uh, dealing with tenure. So we started a program called Post-Tenure Review, in which people who had tenure uh, but failed to or had extended periods of underperformance could be potentially uh, detenured or perhaps reduced in, in salary. Uh, so that, I think, went a long way to set the correct mindset. Um, and the fourth area was the physical plant. Uh, the physical plant was, was quite good in many regards, um, but in some regards was not appropriate for some of the research. Research programs were now larger. Laboratories were little two or three man modules. We made them much larger so it could accommodate larger research groups. We uh, increased the number of cold rooms and common equipment for doing biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, and then we made a massive change in the growth chambers uh, with the help of George Jander, who we had moved, we had recruited. He had worked at, at Monsanto, and they were uh, ending a, a program in the Boston area, and we were able to have them uh, donate, essentially, uh, several thousand square feet of growth chambers. So it dramatically increased our capacity uh, to grow, grow plants. So, um, a lot of important changes, right? A lot of Different important, a levels. lot of important changes. And, then and I think you also many people mentioned that you encourage people to co collaborate across discipline, integrated, as you said, chemistry more into the field. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because Boyce Thompson was created in a different way. For many years, the research was done in particular programs on plant physiology, other things, and this change, uh, changes started during, I think, your tenure at encouraging people to cross, uh, right, from... So one some, of, some of that already was, was uh, happening. I think uh, we sped it up more because of uh, the, some of the programs, the MACE program, uh, Molecular and Chemical Ecology, certainly with the addition of, of uh, George, who was working also in, 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 in uh, uh, biochemistry, and then with the addition of Frank, uh, who was a premier chemist. So we added uh, a considerable strengths in those areas, and that led to natural collaborations. So, um, you know, at the end of, the, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of that um, period in, 2003, 2004, um, Ithaca was, in my opinion, becoming the place or one of the places to come and do modern plant biology, particularly in the area of uh, plant pathology, uh, plant microbe interaction, uh, with the addition of people like Maria Harris and George Jander. Greg Martin was already here, people uh, down in the plant pathology department. So we were rivaling uh, other institutes that were the top of, that is the Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding in Cologne, Germany, or the Sainsbury Lab at the John Innes in, in Norwich, England. So this was a place to come. Uh, and uh, I was quite, quite pleased. Uh, the Now almost everyone had their own 
grants. Uh, on average, the, each lab was bringing in something in order of $700,000 a year for their research. Uh, the endowment draw was down to the target of 5%, which was um, what was sustainable, considered sustainable. Um, we had now in the bank uh, reserve cash of not 300000 but be two to between 2 and $3 million to go forward to hire new faculty to further continue the improvement. So I, I think you you were satisfied with your work as the, as the president, but you also never gave up on your research during that time, and you continue to work as a as a scientist. Could you talk then about the research that you started already at the Waxman Institute in on salicylic acid, acid, and then you continue that research for the next thirty years? We we have time for that. Okay, so. Um, let me start with the interesting story about salicylic acid. When I started my program, excuse me, in, in uh, plant pathology, uh, I hired a uh, postdoc, John Carr, who had worked in England, and he was uh, studying these proteins, the expression of these proteins called pathogenesis-related proteins or PR proteins. Uh, and these proteins were need, known to be produced when uh, a plant was infected. For example, tobacco was infected with tobacco mosaic virus. These proteins were pre being produced, particularly when that plant was going to be resistant. And so they were thought to be involved somehow in the resistance. Well, it had turned out that uh, Ray White, uh, a, a researcher in the same institute, had done an interesting experiment. He had treated tobacco plants with uh, aspirin. Now, why aspirin? Well, he had talked to his mother, and his mother said, you know, whenever I get sick, she says, I take an aspirin. And so that's what he did. He tried, and it was well known at that time that, that aspirin was really just salicylic acid, an acetylated form of salicylic acid. So you do the same thing with, with, with uh, salicylic acid, and you activate the, the expression of the PR genes, produce PR proteins. So um, we were interested, uh, you know, how does this, when you put on a little salicylic acid on tobacco plants, you know, what happens? How, how do these genes get expressed? You know, I'm interested in gene regulation. Well, uh, we found out a little bit, but not a whole lot. But then um, we discovered, in collaboration with Elia Raskin, who would, we had recruited at, the Wax, at, at Rutgers in the Center for the Biotech Center for Agriculture uh, and the Environment, that uh, Salicylic acid, the salicylic acid that's produced in the plant itself was somehow involved in activating the production of these PR proteins, which, which represented the plant's immune response. We discovered it's, it's a hormone. So for the next 30 years, um, I was trying, so we now knew, okay, so salicylic, it's the natural salicylic acid which is doing it. So you didn't have to add it from the outside. It was, so we're trying to figure out what is salicylic acid doing? And this discovery that it was the natural salicylic acid that was doing it was really quite remarkable because before that, the general feeling was salicylic acid was this uninteresting secondary metabolite that was produced by plants, but now we know what the hell does it do? Well, now we knew that you know it did something important in the immune response. Uh, Elia Raskin had previously shown that it was also involved in activating a thermogenesis in certain plants. So for the next 30 years, I tried to just figure out how does it work? How does it activate the immune response? And again, there was the surprise. So if it's a hormone, hormones were generally believed, whether they were in plants or in animals, to act by binding to a specific protein or maybe a small family of proteins called the receptors, and that's how they worked. Well, we discovered over the last 20, 30 years of work with developing new technologies, et cetera, that 
In fact, that's not the way they work, not the way salicylic acid works. It binds to many, many different proteins with different, some it binds very tightly, you might call them the receptors, others more weakly, and the result is that there are dozens of salicylic acid targets, proteins that bind salicylic acid, and there are many different mechanisms of action of how it affects the immune response. Well, coming from the animal field and knowing a bit about salicylic acid, I said, this is really interesting. Uh, why is it interesting? Well, as I said, aspirin, which is the most utilized drug in the world, approximately 100 billion tablets of aspirin are consumed annually, that there must be some connection here because salicylic acid is uh, aspirin just a derivative of salicylic acid. And in fact, once you take an aspirin, within an hour, it's all converted to salicylic acid. Furthermore, what do we use aspirin for? We use it to reduce fever, inflammation, and pain. John Vane, in 19... 97, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 19, uh, sorry, 1971, discovered that uh, aspirin worked by blocking an enzyme called the cyclooxygenases that produce prostaglandins, and those compounds induce pain, fever, and inflammation. Furthermore, but then he also added, he said, interesting, he said, salicylic acid seems to be doing the most, well, more or less the same thing in the human body or in animal systems as aspirin, yet it can't block the activity of the cyclooxygenases. So I said, there must be another mechanism. In addition, for thousands of years, many cultures throughout the world had been using plants that are rich in salicylic acid with salicylic acid derivatives that quickly become salicylic acid when ingested to treat what? Pain, fever, and inflammation. So I said, we've got to figure out, try to figure out how does aspirin, which is really salicylic acid, work in, in humans. We had spent all these years developing technologies to figure out, to identify the targets of salicylic acid in plants. So we said, let's use that to see if we could identify it in humans. And lo and behold, we found many, many targets. In addition, working again with, with uh, uh, Frank Schroeder, we identified a several compounds, a natural compound from licorice root called amorphin B, as well as a synthetic compound that Frank synthesized for us, uh, which was um, ac sorry, acetyl-3 methyl salicylate. I've got it probably wrong, but I... And those compounds were 10 times to as much as a thousand times more effective than salicylic acid at blocking the targets of these proteins that disease-associated activities of proteins that are involved in all, many of the major cancer, heart disease, Crohn's, um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, etc. So the bottom line is there's lots of targets, but we still really don't know how salicylic acid, namely, or aspirin works in humans. Yes. And would you like to talk a little bit also about the other research that you did with the chemist uh, Frank Schroeder and tell us a little bit about the affiliation of uh, Frank Schroeder first with Cornell as a I think you said postdoc student, mm -hmm. and then when you hired him at uh, BTI. So uh, Frank was a postdoc with Jerry Mangwald. I tried to hire him when I was president, but he decided that uh, he really wanted to more, get more training, and so he left with one of the senior faculty members that Harvard had recruited and spent a couple of years at, at Harvard. We were fortunate in recruiting when David became president. He was now interested. 
he was interested in coming back to Ithaca that he really liked, and we recruited him as assistant professor. We, as I was pointing out, we started programs in, in the salicylic acid area because of his strength in biochemistry and, and particular chemistry. Had a number of papers uh, together. We frequently interact at the coffee machine on the second floor. And one day he was describing some interesting results he had with a collaborator, um, Paul Ste uh, Steinberger, uh, at uh, Caltech that uh, in a mouse model, uh, one of these compounds produced by nematodes, which are small worms, uh, would inhibit uh, or suppress asthma-like symptoms in a mouse model. I said, whoa, that's really interesting. I said, Frank, do you know that uh, these nematodes, these, particularly these nematodes in the soil, plant parasitic nematodes, cause 100 to 200 billion dollars of crop, crop loss per year. I said, get me some of this. I'm going to try to see whether it suppresses the immune response in plants. And so fortunately, he was smart enough, as in his extremely smart cat fellow, he had been analyzing these ascaricides. There are hundreds of these ascaricides produced by various nematodes, which are all over on our bodies, on plants, on, in the soil. Uh, so he asked, what do the plant parasitic nematodes produce and actually then excrete into the soil? And they found one was called ascaricide number 18. Ascaricide is simply a, a sugar with a fatty acid side chain. So he gave it to me and uh, I asked, well, is it gonna suppress the immune response in our favorite model, tobacco? Assuming that, well, I put a little salicylic acid on tobacco, it's going to induce the PR proteins part of the immune response. But now if I add both salicylic acid together with the ascaricite, maybe it'll suppress that activation. Well, lo and behold, it, it, it worked by itself, but it didn't activate, it didn't it suppress the uh, activation of the immune response. It activated the immune response just the opposite of what was seen in the mouse system. I said, wow, this is really interesting. So we started to doing molecular studies and showed that it activated the uh, various parts of the immune and innate immunity system, including the salicylic acid dependent one and the ethylene dependent uh, defense responses. And then we began collaborating with various people to try, various uh, researchers to ask, well, what does it do in the Arabidopsis system and, and, and various different crops like tobacco, uh, tomato, rice, corn, with different pathogens, vi viruses, bacteria, fungi, amomycetes. And lo and behold, in most cases, it was activating their immune responses, sometimes extremely well. So a plant that was very, very susceptible to a particular pathogen now be, might become fully resistant. So that was the basis. So let's, hey, let's start a company. And we started a company in 2017. Exactly. Could you explain that this, uh, then, then because I think this is the first uh, startup or first company that would use the uh, breakthrough research from BTI right. to, to apply uh, uh, in various products and uh, right. yes, just to use in, in agriculture, right? Right. Um, so I was initially not that excited about starting a company because I had many patents and none of them did were worth anything eventually. But I thought this was, you know, it had potentially real possibilities. But Paul Debbie and and um, um, Mer uh, Merle uh, Manahara in my laboratory, who was a graduate, who was a postdoc, uh, were very excited about the possibility. As was a friend of Frank Schroeder, uh, Jay Farmer. They were uh, postdocs together in the Mindwell lab and had become close friends. And so uh, they said, well, we really should start. And so we agreed to found this company with, with Frank and myself as senior advisors, uh, and Merle as the chief scientific officer, and Jay Farmer as the chief executive officer. 
uh, and we started doing field trials. Um, and much to our surprise, the field trials gave us better results than the work in, in the laboratory, in the growth chambers, et cetera. This is usually the opposite. You know, something works well in the laboratory, in a growth chamber, you put it out in the field and it just doesn't do anything. So we've now had three years, we're on our third year of field trials, hundreds of field trials all over the United States, Canada, Brazil, uh, and the results are really quite, quite encouraging. And I think the company received some grants from the National Science Foundation, right, to continue the research and uh, expand. So it. much of the uh, funding, the original grant we had was a, a, a normal research grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but then we uh, went on to get funding from NSF, special grants that are designed for startup companies, for for. Uh, uh, transiting or, or um, for translational research that leads to products. So we got uh, very good funding from NSF and uh, subsequently very good funding from NIH. Uh, so we were able to carry out a lot of that work uh, without having to go for outside funding, although we have gone for some outside funding. And we're very excited about it because it has uh, such such potential. Uh, the compound is everything we've done, and we hope we'll have EPA approval within the next year or so. There's no toxicity. It's broad spectrum, so it protects many, many different crops against many, many different diseases, and it's extremely cost-effective. The equivalent of one aspirin worth of the compound, ASCAR 18, we call it Phytolix as, as a trademark. The equivalent of one aspirin, 325 milligrams, protects uh, more than 100 acres of rice. The equivalent of that would require pounds, pounds of fungicide. So it's going to have, I think, a major impact on agriculture and it's sustainable. Yeah. Uh, we are coming to the end uh, of our interview, but then uh, there's one more important element uh, in your career as a scientist. Uh, in the article written on the occasion of your retirement announcement, you were praised by many postgrad students as a mentor. Could you tell us a little bit about your mentoring style? and about how you understand your role as a, as a person who passed this great knowledge to the next generations. I think there are several themes. The one was set high standards and high expectations. So try to hire the best. Expect high levels of performance and demand commitment and hard work. That's one. The second is lead by example. Which means not what you did in the past, what you're doing now. Be there to do the work. I was the first in the morning to be in the lab usually the longest in the day, every weekend. Um, and the third was to uh, go the extra mile for him, personally as well as professionally. You need to get furniture. If they need to stay at a place, we had postdocs because there were many postdocs from all over the world, they came with suitcases. At all, some came, one came with a suitcase and a six six month old baby and a three month old girl. They lived with us for two for two months. Uh, Japanese scientists lived with us for three months, so going that extra mile makes a difference. Thank you, Dan. I think we're going to stop here. Thank you so much for your story. My pleasure.